Welcome to Crown Church Orlando, where we are transforming followers into leaders. We are so thankful that you tuned into the broadcast today. We pray that this message pushes you one step closer to your purpose and accomplishing your destiny. And now, let's go to the message. All right, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. It says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry. Say worry. Listen, this, 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 this message, uh, you, you're going to need a notepad. You're going to need, you're going you're gonna to take some notes. Amen. Because the Bible says in all that getting, get understanding. It says, therefore, do not worry. Say worry. If you're taking notes, worry means, the word worry means to consume in thought. To consume in thought. It's mental preoccupation. It's fear of the unknown. It's to rehearse the future over which you have no control. That's worrying. You're mentally preoccupied of things you have no control over. It says, don't worry about that. Let's get back to the message. Therefore, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, is, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Thank God that God knows what I need. I often says this, God gives you what you need because ultimately what you need is what you really want. Amen? Somebody needs to hear that. You're probably wondering, does God see me? Does God know? God knows what you need. And all of us, the needs may be different. Some of us, it's financial. Some of us, it's, it's emotional. Some of us, it's, it's, it's relational. God knows what you need. That is reassuring right there. But, here's why we're here. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things Sufficient for today is its own trouble. I want to continue in the God's Country series with a message entitled The Kingdom. Say the kingdom. kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say the kingdom one more time. Kingdom. Look at somebody and say everything you need everything is in the kingdom. Okay, find somebody that say everything you need everything. is in the kingdom. You may be seated. You may be seated. I want you to write some words down real quick to keep me on path, to keep me on pace, but also so you can better track with me as well. I want you to write these, these words down real quick. First word I want you to write down is priority. Say priorities. Priority. Second word I want you to write down is religion. Say religion. Third word I want you to write down, it'll be up on the screen for you, say seek. Priorities, religion, seek. Fourth word I want you to write down is righteousness. Say righteousness. And then last word I want you to write down is kingdom. Say kingdom. kingdom. So priorities, religion, seek, righteousness, kingdom. Let's say them together. They'll be up on the screen for you. Let's go. Let's see if we got a good choir in here. Number one, go ahead. I'm telling you, it is a phenomenal thing when you hear your children repeating back at you. Amen. Train up a child. All right. Our priorities determine the quality of our life. Would you agree? Our priorities determine the quality of our lives. And at the same time, they also drive our actions and behaviors. See, failure to establish correct priorities in your life will continue 
and will cause you to waste your time and energy. When you put the wrong priorities into things, places, and people, you will waste your time and you will waste your energy. I know a lot of us, like, I'm glad 2020 is over because there's some things I left behind there. There's some habits I left behind there. There's some situations and even there's some people that I left behind there because you placed priority on them. And as a result, you, you wasted time and you lost, or you wasted energy and you lost time. So priority is extremely important. Incorrect, now, now before yet, I want you to write this down. Your priorities will determine the level of your productivity. Your priorities will determine the level of your productivity. Based on what your priorities are will determine how productive you are. If you make it a priority to take care of your body, you'll be productive. If you make it a priority to take care of your finance, that area will be productive. If you make it a priority to have quality character, to have integrity, you will be productive in those areas. When you neglect and you put priorities in the wrong thing, you will have consequences as a result of that. Now, now, incorrect priorities in your life will lead to forfeiture of purpose resulting in failure. When we place our priorities in the wrong places, ultimately what happens is we can derail our purpose. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. There's some things that we got involved in and it cost us time. It cost us money. And so what is priority defined? Priority defined is this. It's first among all others. It's establishing the most important thing. It is placing highest value and worth upon. It is placing in order of importance. So priority is extremely, extremely important. You don't know this, but you operate your life based on a priority system. You know you do. There are certain people that you spend more time with, they have priority in your life. There are certain people, you don't spend any time with them. They don't have as much priority, right? So, we, so priority is, is, is putting an emphasis on it. Now, all human behavior is driven by the same basic hierarchy of needs. Anybody familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Abraham Maslow has some hierarchy of needs. He says, if you boil it down to its simplest form, there is a hierarchy of what is important to people. There is a hierarchy of what is important when you shave it down, when you reduce it down. The first need that he says is, is physiological needs. These are the basics, food, water, and shelter. At the end of the day, that is where all of our needs begin. We want water, we want food, we want shelter, we want clothing. So when we, when we set out in our lives, we, we want to secure water, we want to secure clothing, we want to secure food, we want to get some nourishment in our body. Once our physiological needs are met, then we move to the next set of needs, which is safety needs. Say safety needs. Safety needs, we look for personal security, we look for resources, we look for health. When we make sure we got food in the house, we got, we got, we got certain things to take care of us physically, we move into safeguarding those things. We move into safeguarding those things. Then we move into safety needs, right? Which is personal security, resources, health, and property. Then once we have our safety needs, we move into love and belonging. We move into love and belonging, which is friendships, family, intimacy. Then the next layer is esteem. We have, where, that's where we draw our confidence from. That's where we have achievements. That's where we have the respect of others and respect by others. A mentor of mine recently gave me a book. I'm getting into it. It's kind of interesting. The Art and Science of Respect. It's like an interesting book. Somebody says, somebody may not like you, but you better make sure they respect you. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you may not like me, but you better respect me. And while you're doing that, you better respect my mind, too. Amen. So, so, so that's, that's in the esteem part. I could go so much into that right there. 
At the end of the day, the Bible says your name is to be chosen above riches. Listen, don't let nobody disrespect you. But at the same time, how you carry yourself either garners respect or garners disrespect. How you treat yourself, how you go about handling your business, how you operate with people will either say, OK, don't fool with them or you know what? Don't respect them. So that's an esteem need. And then, of course, when all of those needs are met, we get into self-actualization. That is realizing your full potential. So these are man's hierarchy of needs. And most people are driven by incorrect priorities that occupy and control their lives. Some people want respect so much they'll neglect their physical bodies. Some people want love so much you'll put your security, your security needs at risk because you want love so much. You see what I'm saying? Some people want recognition so bad that they'll put their livelihood, their emotional state at risk. At the same time, when we look at the word of God, God's priority for mankind is completely opposite to man's personal priorities. And when Jesus Christ shows up and we're reading here, Jesus came to earth to reestablish God's number one priority for all of mankind. I want to let you know the priority that he came to establish was a kingdom, not a religion. God's priority for mankind was kingdom, not a religion. I want to read a quote for you guys concerning religion. It says this, all religions are the same in the sense that they attempt to answer the, the questions of power and meaning. They all promise power to control life and circumstances and to explain life and death. They all claim to have the truth. They all claim superiority over each other. They all compare and compete with each other. They all demand adherence to their particular belief system while denying the others. They, are, they all are motivated by contention and usually thrive in an isolated culture that excludes other segments of humanity. In fact, all religions seem to glory in a spirit of segregation and separatism. Rather than, uni rather than uniting humanity with common power and knowledge of purpose, religion has proven itself instead to be the great divider of mankind. Amen. It's interesting. I want you to leave that up and want you to take a look at it. It's interesting when we run into people and they tell us what religion they're in, walls go up. Oh, he's a Mormon. You know, when they come to the door, we're hiding. So there's a difference between religion and kingdom. There's a difference between religion and kingdom. I want to show it to you real quick. In a religion, religion does this. Religion prepares man to leave earth. It's called escapism. This world is so bad, we just got to leave. That's what religion does. This is why people don't interact with people. Oh, just leave them, because we leave in anyway. Right? Religion prepares man to leave earth, but kingdom empowers man to dominate earth. Religion focuses on heaven. How many heard, heaven is my home? Raise your hand, you ever heard that? Heaven is our home. When I get home to heaven. Listen, that's not the Bible. Heaven is not your home. The Bible says in, in Psalms, I believe it's Psalms 118, he also says it in Genesis, that, that the earth he has given to man, the highest heavens belongs to the Lord. The earth he has given to man. In Genesis 126, he says, let us make man, let him have dominion over the earth. If earth wasn't important, why do you and I, why are we going to need another body? You see what I'm saying? But religion, religion will make you so heaven conscious that you're not earth focused. So we have to understand religion is reaching up to God. Right? But kingdom is God coming down to man. This is what makes our belief in Jesus Christ so different. Every other faith says you have to do something to appease God. 
But our belief, our country says our God himself came and fixed the problem. Right. Religion wants to escape earth. Kingdom wants to impact it, influence it, and change it. That's why, that's why here at Crown Church, we're transforming followers in, into leaders that impact, influence, and change the world. Kingdom. Religion seeks to take earth to heaven. Kingdom seeks to bring heaven to earth. <sighs> Big difference. So the kingdom of heaven must be placed above everything else and should have no competition in our lives it must be our highest priority so what is the kingdom of heaven if you're taking notes simply put the kingdom of heaven is God's country the kingdom of heaven is God's country if you're writing that down it's God's country it's a place it's a literal physical place it's not some mystical place it's not some place see it's easy to put it away over there somewhere and do our thing over here no, the kingdom of God is an actual place. And believe it or not, we are, this earth is under its jurisdiction. Whether you feel it or not, we are. And so, so, so the, the word in Genesis 126 in the Old Testament, the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the New Testament work is basilia. It's a Greek word. And the Old Testament word is mamlaka. It's a Hebrew word. Those two words is where we get the word dominion from. Say dominion. 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 In Genesis 126, when he says, let us make man in our own image, in our own light, and let them have basilia. Let them have mamlaka. Let them have dominion. Let them have sovereign rule. Let them have kingdom. Let them have reign. Let them have royal power. So when God, listen, when God created everything, he says, let them dominate it. Let them dominate it. The interesting thing about it that I just love God because God didn't put any planes in creation. He didn't put any Teslas. I like Teslas. He didn't put any Teslas in the garden. He didn't put any, he didn't put any suits. He didn't put any leather, ladies. He, ain't put, he didn't put 50 pairs of black shoes, ladies. I mean, black is black, right? And y'all going to say, no. Okay, I know. He put all of the raw materials of what we're experiencing now in the garden and he put the blueprint in our souls, in our minds. And man, out of the raw material, out of the ground, out of out of the trees we create, you're sitting on something that was in the garden from the beginning, the bench you're sitting on, the floor you're walking on. Nothing's new in the earth. Everything is just recycled. Everything is old. So when God says, let them have dominion, you are sitting on something that was dominated by man. Man dominated the resources and fashioned a chair. Man dominated the resources and fashioned the car you drove here. Man dominated the resources and fashioned clothes. So what God is saying, have dominion over the earth, is talking about exercising the God-given creativity to produce in the natural, what God gave you in the spirit. Stay with me. So, 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 so both of these words mean dominion. Now, now in the biblical context, when used, it refers to God's government. We're talking about Basilia. We're talking about Mamlaka. It's referring to God's government. It's referring to God's rulership. It's referring to God's dominion over the earth. I want to go somewhere with this. So God's intent is to rule the seen world from the unseen world. I get it. I get it. God's saying, you know what? I want you to see something that I want, but I'm not going to show up for you to see it. I'm going to speak it to you by way of my spirit, to your spirit. Any business owners here? Any business owners here? Your business started before we saw it. Right. You heard something. You saw something. No one else heard it. No one else saw it. And you begin to convince your mind that it was possible. Then you started speaking about it. Now, other people who didn't hear it like you heard it probably doubted it. 
but you did it anyway. And now we're experiencing what God wanted in the unseen to move into the scene. I wonder how many things that are existing in the unseen that God wants to manifest in the scene, but you're too afraid to move on it. That's why it says, call those things that are not as if they were. Because they really are. I'll let you chew on that. So, so Jesus instructs us. See, his will manifesting in our ways, in our actions for the world to see and the world to experience. You don't have to you don't have to ask me who I serve. You should be able to look at me and conclude he served God. I don't have to wear no God is good all the time. T-shirts and hats and bracelets and pins. You should be able to look and go, she's different, right? So, so, so Jesus then instructs us to seek first the kingdom. So our first instruction is to seek. Say seek. Seek means to pursue. Seek means to study. Seek means to explore. It means to understand. It means to learn. It means to consider. Uh, I got to drive this point home. See, seekers must have a desire to know and a passion for what they are searching for. Amen. All right, I need I need young, I need somebody young under 25. Somebody young, young brother. I need a young brother. Stop it, man. You got a whole family. Oh, OK. He un- he un- OK. He un- came. All right. All right. I got to drive this point home. Young man. All right, you may not know this question, but, you know, this, this young generation, they know everything. So, you know, got to ask them. Um, what is a woman's greatest desire? <laughs> All right, I got it. I got it. Uh, love. All right, go sit down. <laughs> Ladies, is he right? Not really. What is a woman's greatest desire? Not, no, no, I, I, I did some research, ladies. I did some research. One, because there's other, there's many of them, but one of them I know when I say it, I know I'm right. A woman's greatest desire is to be passionately pursued. Mm-hmm. See, wives can relate, like, single women, like, I don't know. You know, he got to have some money, Pastor. He got (laughs) to. Wives, am I telling the truth? Oh, don't leave me hanging out here, wives. (laughs) Wives, am I telling the truth? (laughs) Women want to be pursued. They want to know they are wanted. Ladies. I'm out here, all the way out here, and you're just leaving me out here. Ladies, say amen. I will move on to some other subject. I'm trying to drive a point home. Women want to be pursued. They want to know they're wanted, right? So as a result, where did that, where did that, that characteristic come from? To be desired, to be wanted, came from the creator. Because when I look at our relationship with God, he's the same way. He says in Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me. What? When you search for me. What? Not just the casual search, not just the casual search, not just opening the Bible on Sunday, not just praying when times are bad. When you search me with all your heart, that word means with all your mind. You'll find me. You'll find me. In, in, in James chapter 4, verse 8, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So God's saying, you got to seek me. You got to want me because I know what I come to the table with. I know how my life is going to change. Listen, I know how I'm going to change your life. I know what my presence is going to do for you. Girl, you're going to have some joy, man. You're going to have some peace. 
You're going to have abundance following you. But listen, I don't compromise. You got to want me for real, for real. It can't be casual. Listen, you're not going to get the Bible says seek, pursue, like go after like, God, I'm trying to know you for real. Listen, I spend a lot of time going after him because at the end of the day, it's like this. Anybody who's ever had the opportunity by the, to, to experience God's mercy and grace where you could have died out there. Amen, somebody. You could have caught something. You could have got killed, but you're still here. And you remember how hard you went when you was out there. The least that I could do, I got to go hard for God, too, because I need like what is the point of coming into this thing, having all of these promises that are possible, but never experience them? The devil is a liar. God, I want everything that you said I could have. I want to experience. I want to know what this peace that surpasses all understanding feels like. I want to experience what this grace feels like. I want to experience what the Bible talks about, this security in him, having him be a strong tower. I want all of it. But it's not going to happen casually. You got to go after it. You got to go after it. You got to pursue it. So to seek means to give diligent dedication and preoccupy oneself in what one is seeking. The kingdom must be pursued. The kingdom must be studied. The kingdom must be understood. Last week I shared with you that I wasn't born here. So for me, I had, and my parents had to contribute. So when we were home speaking a different language, they had to intentionally speak this language at home so that we can catch it quicker so that we would not be at a disadvantage at school. You see what I'm saying? So there were certain things in this country that we needed to understand. Every time somebody said a word I didn't understand, I looked it up, went to the dictionary. I want to make sure nobody was trying me. Right? I wanted to make sure, okay, what's that? Okay, when, you know, so you, you, because I'm trying to get and I'm trying to understand this thing, this idea called America. And the same way, the kingdom is the same way. You have to pursue into the kingdom and go, well, why did God say that? What does he mean by, by his stripes we are healed? What does he mean by that? How can I experience this? How is it that in the time of the disciples, they walked in their shadow was healing people. They casting out devils. How? What? Why don't we have that now? Because religion saw the kingdom in operation and copied it. That's why the Bible says we have the form of godliness but deny the power thereof because there's a difference between power and authority and I'll teach it you could have power and have no authority and we trying to cast out devils with power with no authority that's why the devil could say Paul I know I know Paul Jesus I know I don't know you you're not authorized listen you can have access to my car you can have the keys to my car. You have the power to take my car anywhere. But if the sheriff department finds you, you may go to jail. Why? You were not authorized to operate it. So a lot of times we're attracted to power in the church. Oh, power, power. I don't want power. I want authority. You see what I'm saying? Power is just the distribution of what you're authorized to do. When you pray, don't ask for power. Listen, listen, authority will, authority will say a prayer like this. In the name of Jesus, you're healed and walk off. That's authority. Power will want to come out, come out, come out, come out. Hold it. Come out, come out, come out, come out, come out. Walking backwards, come out. Parents, you know. When you speak to your children, you don't have to raise your voice. Hey Amen. Go, go brush your teeth. Go change. Authority. See, he laugh. He know. <laughs> he know. Authority. And so what, what, I'm, what's, what I'm saying is when you move into the kingdom, God authorizes. You, you come into authority. You see what I'm saying? 
And so, so you can't successfully pursue if you, are pre- if you are preoccupied with purposeless things. You can't successfully pursue. Next word, righteousness. Say righteousness. See, the word righteous. Seek first righteousness. Righteousness means to be aligned with authority. To be in right standing with authority. To have correct fellowship with authority. To have right rulership with authority. Can you imagine somebody trying to ask you to do them a favor and y'all not on the same page? It's going to be difficult to get that favor done, right? But when you're in the right fellowship, in right alignment, in right standing, in right proximity to God, you can ask for a thing. You can decree a thing and it shall be established because I'm in alignment. See, religion says, hey, you got to do 20 jumping jacks and you got to run around the block real quick and then it'll happen. That's what religion will say. Right. But 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 the kingdom will say, no, no, no. Just align yourself in righteousness. Align yourself to God. Align, be in the right posture and the right fellowship with him and what you are saying will be established seeking and aligning with God's country as a result this is what we'll have all of your physical needs will be met all of your social needs will be met all of your emotional needs will be met all of your psychological needs will be met all of your financial needs will be met because everything you need is in God's kingdom I don't know how else to say this anybody here ever traveled outside of America raise your hand the minute you left here, you completely was in a different what country. And if you have the opportunity to go to a country where the time is different or we had the chance when we went to Jamaica, they were driving. It, 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 it made us panic a bit because they were driving on the, on the left side. We're like, you're on the wrong side. See, we were in a different country. The rules, everything was different. The language was different. The currency was different. And what I'm trying to say to you is God is trying to move you into his country. Understand that everything is going to change from this point on. What you are coming out of is not coming in with you. Amen. His country must be our top priority. We must place our highest value on his kingdom. Our highest priority and greatest desire should be to enter God's country and thirst for right relationship with him. But here's the problem. The problem is we're trying to understand the majesty of heaven with the mindset of earth. We're trying to understand the majesty of heaven with the mindset of earth. It's two different concepts. Our concept of heaven is different. As I'm, as I'm transitioning and closing, there is nothing more powerful than an idea. Would you agree? You could kill a person, but you can't kill an idea. Our country is dealing with remnants of an idea that was deposited four or five years ago. You see what I'm saying? It's an idea. When an idea possesses someone, good luck. So, so ideas, ideas is where concepts come from. So, for example, a concept is an idea that has been crystallized in the mind, in a person's mind, and they have a picture of it. And they try to convey it to you, that picture, in words. They try to convey that picture to you in words. The problem is you and I would have to have the same concept in order for us to effectively communicate. Amen. So, for example, now I told you, my wife grew up born saved. Always. You see what I'm saying? Always saved. Like, I remember in high school, it was like she had angels following her. It's like, nope, not her. All right, she's free game. <laughs> not her. It's like there was this glow around her, right? So, my wife has always been saved. And it just baffles me, like, man, you really were, like, sheltered. So, I grew up Miami. And... Every six months to a year, the terminologies in the street changes. You see what I'm saying? So concepts, ideas. Like, so you go, like you went in the early, she understand now. Back in the days, you can't go to my wife and be like, hey, you know, I'm going to come back and pick up that bread later. You see what I'm saying? 
because you may have a loaf of bread waiting for you. <laughs> I joke with her all the time. I'd be like, man, you are not surviving these streets. <laughs> oh, Lord. It's just hilarious. So the concept, like, where's the cheese? The concept has to be the same. You see what I'm saying? So, so it's the same, like, there's, like, and so when we, when we got married and we, there are certain concepts that I didn't understand with the kids and certain things. I, I lit, man, thank God for grace, you know, because she had to coach me through certain, oh, I thought you meant give them all, no, not all the food, not this, don't, you know, thank God our kids are good. They, 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 they made it good. But there were certain terminologies that I didn't know at the time. So the ability to communicate, we would be at a disadvantage because we're not operating with the same concept. And what happens is God's trying to convey one message to us, but we have a different concept of what he's talking about. So in our mind, deep down, like somewhere in our minds, we really, we really think we could vote God in. God is not a president. Heaven is not a republic. There is no voting system. See, even this election that happened, you go, all right, man, you got four years, man. Let me see what happens. The vote ain't free, Joe. So you got, but the way democracy, which is man's, it's man-made, the way democracy is set up is the majority rule, right? You get to vote. You don't like it, you vote someone else in. You don't like it, you vote someone else in, right? The problem with that form of government is, what if the majority is wrong? And what if what they vote into place is wrong? I mean, it, it ain't even been seven days. One of the executive orders is to give transgender boys the privilege to compete in sporting event with girls. It ain't even been seven days. You see what I'm saying? So that's democracy. And if enough people in the majority say, we don't like it, because there was a time in history where things got out of hand and people was like, oh, okay, we, we got here because we went too far from God. And so, so, so people who were God-fearing got into politics, got into the school, and there was a time in history where things were extremely conservative in this country. And then things kind of died down, calmed down, and, and then you had this flare-up in the 60s. You see what I'm saying? And we're seeing this roller coaster ride of, of, of extreme conservative, extreme conservative, extreme conservative. That's democracy. You see what I'm saying? But the problem with democracy is whatever the majority decide, hang on for the ride. So if the majority say, hey, you know, this is the definition of family and marriage, then that's just the majority. Some people go on buckets, some people gonna go appeal to the Supreme Court, but that's what the majority says. But at the same time, if the majority said, no, um, don't call him a boy, it's interesting. Oh, I'm hearing some stuff. It's interesting when the parents go to the sonogram to look at the gender of their child, the doctor says, okay, they, they look and be like, okay, we see a third leg, that's a boy. They say, boy. We look, no third leg, girl. Right? Anybody who got kids? That's what they said, right? It's interesting, but when they kill or abort them, they don't say boy. They don't say girl. They say fetus. Because in a democracy, you can change the rules to fit the narrative. Make sense? So what I'm saying to you is the problem with religion, the problem with religion, religion says this. They're not behaving like us. They're not following our ways. That's why in history, some of the bloodiest bloodshed of people being killed was at the hand of Christians. The conquest. You see what I'm saying? And this is like convert or die. Christians, religion. But in the kingdom, what God is saying in the kingdom is, I want to start in the hearts of men. 
and rule in such a way that you can be around other people who have other views, that have other preferences or whatever, and something in them is going to realize something is missing. And they're going to be drawn to the way you love them. They're going to be drawn by the way you operate. They're going to be drawn like, man, you could have judged me, but you didn't. You're different. And then that's when we respond. My kingdom's not of this world. But they Christian. Oh, I can't stand. Oh, oh, atheists can't stand Christians. Because we pushed it on them. When God is saying, I don't want you to push anything on anybody. I want you to live right there around them, among them, be among them, go in there, and I'm going to start small with you. And they're going to start with, you're the only one on the block that's kingdom. And next thing you know, your neighbor's going to be kingdom. The neighbor's going to be kingdom. The neighbor's going to be kingdom. Because this life is attractive. They want it. They're looking for it. You see what I'm saying? So that's what God wants to do with us. If you ever were wondering, God want to start with you and then let it go out. So as I'm closing, I want to close with this. In order to return to experiencing royalty, repentance is required. Now, it does not mean it does not just mean to change your thinking. It means to exchange your thinking. It means to reverse your thinking to live in the kingdom of God. We have to think opposite to the way that we have been taught. The result of changed thinking is a changed life. Somebody say amen. amen. See, you have to think different in order to survive in the kingdom. And if it starts with understanding and, and, and this thinking starts with understanding God's purpose. Hear me. The wonderful thing about kingdom, the wonderful thing about God's country is you don't have to be judgmental. Did you know that? Listen, I just freed a lot of y'all. I just freed a lot of y'all. You don't have to be judgmental. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. Oh, look at. Oh, my goodness. Look. You don't have to be judgmental. It frees you. Because, listen, how do you argue with someone that they're from another country? Uh-uh. You're not from Puerto Rico. He's speaking Spanish. Eating my, is it mafungo? Okay. I want to make sure. Okay. Eating my fungo, you see what I'm saying? Caña frita. Oh, boy. What? Si. Poquito. The point is what I'm saying is when someone's from a different culture, you just have to accept it. You see what I'm saying? You just have to accept it because they're from a different culture. And I'm here to tell you, there's really two cultures in the world. Light, dark. You see what I'm saying? And if you have been pulled out of the dark, I'm saying Bible now, into the light, God called you to live as light, not to point out dark. We know when we were in the dark. Amen. And we know what's missing. So what's, what God is saying, I want you to be light. And those who are in darkness will begin to be drawn to you. The problem with religion is when they came and thought it was authentic, they look, ah, uh, counterfeit Christian. Hypocrite. They came to you and saw, ah, oh, man, you're doing what I'm doing. Listen, write this down real quick. God's purpose is to establish a family of sons and not servants. God's purpose was to establish a kingdom of sons and not subjects. God's purpose was to establish a commonwealth of citizens and not Christians. I know I'm messing with your religion right now. God's purpose was to establish, relation, was to establish relationship and not religion. We got religious. You see what I'm saying? Do you know how many people are lost, are searching, are looking for God. They're looking for God's love. They're looking for peace. You know how many people who got everything, they got the money, they got the house, and they about to take pills this week to end it all because they ain't got no peace. And here we are with peace, with joy, but we live in a silo. 
Religion says just hang with Christians, just be with Christians, just talk to Christians. Listen, I said this before. The worst experience of my life was working at a church. Religion. I got some stories for y'all. I'm talking about my whole 30 plus years of church, not just in Orlando. I'm saying not just churches I've attended, church, period. I got some stories. I got, might put it in a memoir. The memoir of Duma Alphonse. In college, I wrote a paper how my how religion almost cost me my relationship with God. That was my paper before I graduated. How religion almost cost me my relationship with God. And so as I'm closing, I want you to understand this. God's original intent was to extend heaven to earth. And his plan for accomplishing this is to establish a colony of heaven on earth. If you're from the islands, you understand what a colony is. See, the culture of the country is in the colony. Write that down. The culture of the country is in the colony. Fun fact, your colon is one organ that starts from your tongue all the way to your one organ. Whatever starts off in your mouth, colon so essentially the principle is whatever is in heaven ends up in the colony that's why Jesus said when you pray pray on earth as it is in heaven that's why we we interact with pieces of kingdom when you go to a franchise a, a, a restaurant in this state in another state and they serve the same menu that's remnants and pictures of kingdom so God is saying, whether I'm in Orlando or Miami or wherever, when I interact with you, when people interact with you, they should experience kingdom. Amen. Our fulfillment is attached to purpose. I want to close with this. Can I have a chair? I want to close with this. I'm going to grab this store real quick. I'm going to grab this store. Purpose is original intent. Okay. So. I've used this example before, felt led to use it again. What is the purpose of this chair? What is the purpose of this chair? To sit. This chair was created for what? Sitting. That means until someone sits in this chair, the chair will not experience fulfillment of its purpose. Yes? Yes. So if I take this chair and hit someone with it, throw it, break into something, even though the chair worked in that capacity, that was not its purpose. So, the, so that is an abnormal use of the chair, yes? Which means I abused, abnormal use. I abused the chair. Some of us are being abused in life because we're not operating according to the purpose for which we were created. It's not until I get in the chair and sit down that the chair can experience fulfillment. In the process of the chair experiencing fulfillment, I'm experiencing relief. You were created to live in the kingdom and operate in the kingdom. That's your purpose. Anything outside of that purpose is abnormal use. It's abuse. That's why you're so frustrated with certain things. That's why, because you're not fulfilled until you get in God's country. When you get in God's country, everything now flows. You experience fulfillment and other people get to experience heaven on earth. You see what I'm saying? So God is saying, I want other people to experience what my country is like through you. Your life, your marriage, your parenting, your business, your friendships. When they deal with you, I want them to experience heaven. And their only conclusion is, yo, put me onto that. Put me onto that. When you traveled, they pushed the black, they sent the white sands, the, the blue ocean. They don't push no prime minister on you. Think about it. When you go into, do you know what Tahiti's president or anything look like? Nope. You know what the ocean and the beach look like. And that's why we have a hard time getting people into to God. We want them to meet the president, Jesus, before they experience the lifestyle. So God is saying, no, I want you to live the lifestyle. 
And then when they come for the lifestyle, you tell them, you point them to the way. I want peace. I want joy. I want health. And you go, okay, the only way to peace, to joy, to health is through Jesus. Thank you so much for tuning into this broadcast. We pray that you are blessed by the message. If this ministry has truly added value to your life, then we want you to prayerfully consider supporting financially. Now allow me to say thank you for any past, present, or future contributions that you're led to give. Thank you also for joining us on this journey of transforming followers into leaders that impact, influence, and change the world. At Crown Church, all that we do is for His glory and His glory alone. Until next time, be blessed and have a great day.